If you haven't been following Conversations with Shonda, please visit conversationswithshonda.org. If you're in the Minneapolis area, be sure to check out Conversations with Shonda live. Enjoy the show. I'm Shonda with uh, Conversations with Shonda, uh, part of the Minneapolis Foundation podcast. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to start out and just ask um, each of you to just introduce yourself to our listener, and I will start out with you, sir. Hey, Keith Ellison here. Uh, I'm the Attorney General for the state of Minnesota, and uh, I uh, have been uh, concerned about uh, how Minnesotans get along with each other for quite a long time. So I'm really pleased uh, that uh, Christian Picciolini is here today to, to talk with us. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm Christian Picciolini. I'm here with my friend, Attorney General Keith Ellison, um, in Minnesota to talk about uh, a rising environment of hate and intolerance mm-hmm. and what we can do about it. And so we have a lot of Minnesotans that are very comfortable in their lanes and in their communities of comfort is what I like to talk about. And the Minneapolis Foundation has been doing a lot of work to figure out how do we talk about issues that are grittier or things that are happening that need to be amplified and that and, and made and people be being made more aware of them. And so it's a bit shocking to me that there's a growing sort of movement of hate here in Minnesota. And is that true? Sean, I should probably have included in my introduction that I'm also a former violent extremist. Uh, I now run an organization called the Free Radicals Project to help people disengage from hate. And what I've seen happen over the last 20 years is a very steady increase uh, and buildup of what we're seeing today uh, and calling a white nationalist movement. This was something that in the 80s and 90s was very visible. Uh, But then in the late 90s went underground uh, for several reasons, Uh, because they thought it would be more effective to recruit people in the mainstream, uh, but also because there was tremendous pressure from law enforcement during the 80s and 90s for that. Uh, So it was a a dual pronged strategy, both to kind of go underground to hide, but also to go underground to to reach more people with their message. And when you say underground, what you mean is like you're not walking around with like your head shaved yeah. and tats showing. Is that kind of the thing? Yeah. Like, what what does it look like now? How did how did it resurface? I call it boots to suits. So you know, in the '80s and '90s, there was very much the you know shaved heads and the boots and the tattoos and the clan hoods and things like that. And they were uh, you know people in this movement were very visible. They were easy to spot, even for law enforcement. Uh, but then there was a strategy to really grow the hair out, to not get tattoos, to, to disengage from groups that were active because we recognized that at the time it was easier for law enforcement to take down a hierarchical you know, structure of a group than it would be if people were just functioning on their own. Uh, but I can tell you, I, after I left in 1996, uh, I never thought that I would see what we're seeing today. I have to go back to you know, some of the beginning in terms of how you um, got into the movement, because, you know, as a 14 year old, you know, how did you, you couldn't have been picking up on those messages. Were you at 14? To tell you the story, Shonda, of, of my recruitment at 14 years old, you know, when I was standing in an alley in 1987, smoking a joint and a man with a shaved head comes up to me and he pulls the joint from my mouth and he looks me in the eyes and he said, that's what the communists and the Jews want you to do to keep you docile. I didn't know at 14 what a communist was, if I'd ever met a Jewish person, or even what the word docile meant. And nothing that he said made sense to me. But what made sense to me and what was attractive was, for the 14 years prior to that, I felt abandoned by my parents, who didn't abandon me. They were immigrants who just had to work seven days a week, 16 hours a day. And I wasn't smart enough or mature enough to ask why I felt abandoned and what they were doing. He promised me a sense of identity, community, and purpose instantly. Because what he did after pulling that joint from my mouth and saying that is he asked me my name. And I was afraid to tell him because my last name is hard to pronounce, Picciolini, and it was mangled by every bully that I'd ever met. Uh, it unfortunately rhymes with weenie, so you know you could pretty much make anything you know go with that. Kids are me, yeah. But he didn't laugh at me. He said, "That's an Italian name, and you should be proud of that." Mm. And that was all I knew. I'd grown up in an Italian household with Italian parents in an Italian neighborhood on the south side of Chicago, where other families had emigrated to from the same villages that my parents came from. So I I felt more Italian than I felt American, even though I was born here. I was the first. Um, 
So when he said that, he started to say, well, you know, your ancestors were great warriors and great thinkers and artists, and you should be proud of that. And somebody wants to take that away from you. And as a kid, the only thing I'd known, him offering me a sense of family, you know, a sense of purpose to save something of great value that was being replaced. Um, it was uh, pretty intoxicating for a powerless 14 year old to suddenly embrace that and be embraced because they did deliver at first a sense of this, you know, paradise on earth and even the promise of paradise after death, sure. which is a pretty common, uh, you know, uh, dangler for, for any extremist group. So I think we have assumptions around who gets into a mess as children and usually there's yeah. not a dad around. And so here you have these hardworking uh, parents yeah that um, are raising you, um, likely to do the right thing. And meanwhile, you're being um, seduced yeah. and you're piling guns in their basement. Yeah. So what didn't happen in the, in the house for you? Oh. Or what advice, either what didn't happen or what advice do you have for parents that are listening and yeah. concerned perhaps about their... And, and I think that's the operative word is listen, right? And we need to listen to our children from the youngest age possible and listen for, for what they're not necessarily saying, what they're trying to convey that words sometimes can't. Um, because had you know a baseball coach or a football coach come up to me in that alley at 14 years old, I would have gone with that person. Even if that skinhead who was America's first neo-Nazi skinhead who promised me paradise was standing right there, I would have gone with the baseball coach. That person just never came. So as a parent, you know, I think we really need to empower our children's passions. We need to listen to them rather than dictate to them everything. Uh, you know, we shouldn't shape them into a version of ourselves. We should find a way to amplify the version of them that we can help shape them into. And so you didn't just get involved, you um, really emerged as a leader yeah. when um, he went to jail, the guy who recruited you yeah. went to jail. Um, and so now you're leading in this movement. Yeah. So something about it was... It was what? empowering, it was intoxicating. I had, I had gone from somebody who had been bullied to shaving my head and wearing boots and having the bullies avoid me and cross the street. Just the act of me being involved whether I believed it or not, whether I said anything or not, was powerful. Uh, and I took that, you know, one step beyond every time I would feel intoxicated, I'd keep going. It was a, very much like a drug. I knew in the back of my mind it was killing me that it was wrong because I wasn't raised that way. Mm. Uh, my parents were immigrants. They were victims of prejudice when they came in many instances, so it wasn't part of our family DNA. Mm. Uh, but the further you go in, the harder it is to get out. Uh, because you have to abandon everything about your identity, community, and purpose, and start over in a world that may not want you back. And what was what did the when did your parents become aware of what you were doing? The day I came home with a shaved head, maybe a week or two after that meeting in the alley, and I was proud to show them that because it was now my way to hurt them, mm -hmm. to get back at them for what I felt they had done to me. And they tried, they okay. tried. And they were, they didn't give up. And I'm glad they never did. Uh, it didn't work. It didn't seem to work at first anyway. But eight years later, I was able to finally make my way back. I had to wrestle down some emotions uh, to sit here with you today. I'm sure. So for, for the harm you did cause, um, how have you repaired that? It's a very important question. And I'm glad that you asked that. To me, repairing the harm that we've caused or that I've caused are the terms for forgiveness for me continuing to do that. Um, you know, at first, when I got out in 96, I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to do anything. I wanted to hide. Uh, and that lasted for a few years until I met somebody who I had hurt in my past, um, who I apologized to and who told me, you know, thanks very much for your apology, but that doesn't do a damn thing for me. Uh, and, uh, you know, made me understand that I needed to seek forgiveness and repair the harm that, and the damage that I had caused. Was uh, this the coach? The, this was the security guard at oh, my the old high school, guard, yeah, yeah okay. Mr. Holmes, and, uh, and and who was African American, African American security and who you guard, fought. who I had tormented in that high school. You know everything from f you know fist fights uh, to you know protests in the hallways for a white student union to pickets out in front of the school. Yeah, it was. It was not a good time, but, you know, one thing that he, on top of, you know, making sure that I would promise him to repair the harm that I caused and understand why I needed to, um, which I finally did, um, you know, he also told me that 
he saw what he saw in me in every single student that he had ever worked with, white, black, uh, you know, Latinx, who could have gone in a direction that they, that they shouldn't have. Uh, and what have I done? Uh, you know, for the last 20 years, I have been trying to help disengage people from these groups to try and mitigate, you know, future damage, uh, to try and prevent people from going down that road. But I've also worked in communities and I've also, uh, I think I've been a good ally uh, to people of color uh, in helping raise their voices and in standing with them even when they couldn't stand there to try and, and, and speak up for them, which is you know, not something I want to do or should be doing. They should have their own voice. And just for our listeners to get a, a little bit of a sense of um, what has happened in, in Minnesota, before we um, started, Recording, you talked a little bit about um, being in Minnesota and Stillwater, mm-hmm. and um, I kind of joked and asked, "Were you at the jail?" You said no, and you came here for for what reason? So, in 1992, early 1992, my wife uh, at the time and I, when we were 20 years old, had uh, almost bought a house here in Minnesota. Um, and it was a hotbed uh, back at the time for, uh, you know, this was before the internet, so music was a really big uh, vehicle for propaganda. So that's what the CDs were all about. The CDs were all about that. So actually, Jeff had met me when I was here in Minnesota, when he was just kind of a, a kid coming up, and I mm-hmm. had kind of graduated up. But there were, you know, bands here, there were a lot of skinheads based here. Uh, the part of the organization that I was helping lead, the Northern Hammer Skins, uh, that were part of this, the Hammer Skin Nation, a larger uh, international group, were based here uh, in St. Paul, in East St. Paul. Mm-hmm. And so now, um, you know, you're, you're going across the country, you're here in Minnesota, and Keith, you are with him, and you're gonna go talk to uh, some of our neighbors yeah. and residents of our state And there has to be something that you're seeing that makes you want to focus on this issue. Well, um, we had a mosque bombed last year, bombed by some group called themselves a white rabbit militia. But we're also seeing uh, we had uh, we're coming up on the first anniversary of the Tree of Life synagogue getting shot up. Eleven people got killed at worship. And then, of course, the Powell High synagogue, people got killed there. Then, you know, there was the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. You know, had to hire El Paso. Look, we got to do something. I believe that if people of who recognize the dignity and humanity of others won't stand up and discuss and talk about this, it just sort of leaves. It, 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 we're kind of yielding the field mm-hmm. to the people who want to promote tribalism, negativity, violence. And by the way, you know, don't forget the Second Amendment. These people are into guns. So it's important to try to push out and say, look, we're going to settle our political disputes at the ballot box uh, or in the First Amendment free expression, not with guns and violence and bombing out here on the streets. That's what we got to do. Um, I, you know, I uh, I will tell you this. I definitely feel that, we, you know, we're going to. So in the state of Minnesota, I've been to Fergus Falls talking about this. I've been to uh, Eastern Chaska, been to, uh, we were at Temple Israel the other day and we were at uh, uh, the mosque on Friday and we're going to St. Cloud. Now, you know, St. Cloud was highlighted in the New York Times for being a particularly racist town. And, you know, I know most people in St. Cloud are probably people mostly concerned about themselves and their own family. If we don't go there and engage people Oh, we just treat them like, oh, we're not going there. You let you let the folks who want to promote this tribalistic hatred, you know, you let them build. Yeah. And we're not going to let them build, not unaddressed. Mm-hmm. You know, so I appreciate you joining me. It's my pleasure. And, and I don't want people to think that I think that everybody in St. Cloud is a bad, racist, neo-Nazi, Ku Klux Klan, blah, blah, blah. I don't believe that. Even if they are, I'm willing to say, let's work together. Let's do Let's do something new. Cause they do. Here's my thing about the Klan and the Nazi. They don't give a crap about white people. I don't believe they do. Right. I don't believe they give a damn about your average white person any more than if some plantation owner cared about some poor white person working on their farm. Mm-hmm. They they're just using you. 
And so, Christian, you talk about the potholes. And so it, it strikes me that, you know, there's a sense of belonging and connection and the tribalism, Keith, that you mentioned, mm -hmm. and that you talked about, like, identifying the potholes. Can you can you share what that is? Yeah. You know, my theory is that people are led to these types of hate movements because of the traumas in their life, the things that they encounter on a daily basis that have kind of detoured them to the fringes where these narratives, uh, you know, where they're they're able to accept them. And potholes can be anything from, you know, physical or emotional trauma to poverty uh, to lack of education, but even privilege. Privilege is a pothole uh, if it keeps us isolated from the reality of the world, if it keeps us isolated from other people. Um, and, you know, pothole, there can be millions of different potholes and sometimes there are a combination. Uh, but uncertainty is really what kind of bubbles up from all of those or shame even in some cases. Yeah, and when uh, you talked a little bit earlier about folks going underground in the boots to the suits, mm -hmm. and um, I think just, you know, I was when I talked with Robin D'Angelo, we talked a little bit about we have this image of what a racist looks like, mm -hmm. and they're like in the hood, and they're like doing these god-awful things, and um, it would be easy to walk away and say, well, the extremists and the white nationalists that exist today are the ones that are toting guns, you know, they're threatening violence, they're going into places and, and taking lives. And I know that we're probably working and living amongst people. And um, and I'm curious on the language, right? Like, because I'm hearing very coded language right now. And what should we be listening for? Well, unfortunately, they're very good at changing and changing fast. So they're always changing their language. But, you know, I would I would look at policies, right? If they're especially in the political realm, if they're pushing for kind of isolationist or segregationist policies, you know, everything from immigration to even foreign policy and how hmm. we, you know, either are, are an ally to, you know, people who we've treated well and have treated us well, or we are now siding with people who are, you know, not the not so good guys in the world. Right. Um, so, you know, I think we need to listen for, uh, you know, words that divide us rather than me pointing out specific words because, you know, by the time I say it in this airs, they will have come up with a new hand signal, a new word, a new way to talk about something. A new it's, name or something. Exactly. It, let's look at the intentions of people. If, if the intentions are to further divide us or to isolate us even more, uh, that's what we should be looking at. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, what, what should we think about a guy like, say, uh, Spencer, um, you know, he uh, speaks really fine English and uh, went to Duke and uh, PhD. And uh, I think Richard, the races Richard, come yeah. in all stripes uh, yeah, yeah. and and try to hide their their truest intentions with you know Brooks Brothers suits. Mm -hmm. And I think we shouldn't fall for it. Again, it's about actions and intentions. Right. So we have um, folks of color and um, various religious backgrounds that talk often about their experiences. Mm -hmm about uh, not feel included or being attacked or being uh, victimized in some way, um, being in hostile work environments, all of these types of things. And often um, it goes unheard or not responded to. And um, does it take a former white extremist to get extremists out, right? Like, I mean, is it is it possible like, you know, to Keith's point, like there's a, a degree of empathy and understanding. And um, I believe um, the, the gentleman that helped you from your school was an African-American guy, right? Like what what happens when you encounter it? And I know that you're doing work to pull people out, but, you know, I'm not I don't speak the language, you know. And so when you encounter it, what what do we do? Yeah, well, first of all, I should say it's never the responsibility of the potential victim to, to be the one to reach out with empathy. That I'm, I would never put that responsibility on people of color to do that, uh, which is one of the reasons why I do it, you know, to try and disengage. But let's be clear, what I do is a Band-Aid. Uh, you know, I, I am a, a garbage man, you know, trying to pick up whatever's left to, to salvage, right? Uh, if we want to beat this, we have to prevent it from happening. And that 
is changing our systems and our institutions to not be racist. It's making you know policies equitable uh, and about making sure that social services are there for you know from the day we're born to make sure that we don't ever hit those potholes or if we do that there are support there to kind of help us navigate. That's what will defeat extremism, not you know. A, language that's completely counter to it, not debate, not punching, you know, Richard Spencer in the nose. Right, right. Might make you feel good, but it does not change anything. In fact, yeah, it, it didn't change makes, his mind. No, it, it makes things flame. worse. Yeah. 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 So what I would say is we need to create the culture that we've been professing that this country is, that we've never really attained. And that is equity and that is justice and that is a way for us to be great, but our greatness will only come through our goodness. Okay. So yeah, if you don't mind, so, so my, I'm curious about your thoughts on this issue, the anti-Semitism. If I can be very candid, mm -hmm. you know, it kind of felt like the you know, United States used to really be a pretty anti-Semitic country, but then, it seemed like we hit the 50s, 60s, somehow you just didn't hear about it as much. You didn't hear about the attacks on the synagogue as much. You didn't hear it. Too much. Even the, the even the religious folk who used to talk about Christ killing mm -hmm. kind of stopped talking about that and became extremely pro-Israel, mm -hmm. you know? And I mean, this is, you know, what I've observed. And now you got this violent, anti-Jewish stuff. I mean, as a black person, I mean, I'm kind of used to it. I mean, it's just kind of the way it's always been this way. But this seems like the anti-Semitism is resurging. And in the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, they didn't say the blacks will not replace mm -hmm. us. They didn't say the Hispanics will not replace us. They said Jews will not replace us, which struck me as odd. Yeah. Well, how do you how do you help us understand that? There's always been, you know, the the base underlying theme of, of you know neo Nazi or white supremacist or white nationalist ideology has always been the premise that Jews, even though they're a small population of people in the world, control everything, control the vast majority, which is a completely false, you know, conspiracy theory that frankly go, dates back to 1903 when the Russian Tsar uh, Nicholas put out a fraudulent document called the Protocols of the Elders mm. of Zion, mm -hmm. which was the supposedly leaked document of a you know of a meeting of secret Jews trying to control the world. Well, it was a forgery, it was a fake, and he put it out during the pogroms of Russia. That propaganda machine has never stopped. In fact, that book was instrumental to my radicalization, mm -hmm. and it's instrumental to the radicalization of Al-Qaeda members, of ISIS members, because wow. it talks about, you know, I'm putting up air quotes to your listeners, the Jewish problem, mm -hmm. right? So there's always been that undercurrent. Why I've seen the far right kind of cozy up to Israel is because they really believe that Israel is theirs, hmm. right? The, the, you know, the ultra Christian kind of uh, movement wants to reclaim Jerusalem and, and, and the land of Israel as, as the land of their religion. I thought they liked it because, you know, they thought, you know, Israel is, is a state where, you know, they feel it's a bit of a, a, a you know, what they call an ethnic. Right, state. right, right. And they feel that maybe they could turn Idaho into one. Yeah. You, know? I, you know, listen, the, that whole discussion is something that they'll use on both sides. They'll, yeah, still, yeah. they'll be anti Semitic on one side, they'll be pro Israel on another. <laughs> uh, the truth is, they don't really, they, want right. to, they don't like anybody. Like you said yeah. earlier, they're a very nihilistic worldview that wants to essentially flatten and scorch the earth and start over. Mm. And only the strong that will have survived that scorching of the earth will be the, you know, the... So they do want to burn it all down. They do. They want to burn it down. They're do not American. They're not patriots. They are anti-government. They are anti-democracy, just like I was 30 years ago. Do you, do you think our president has any role to play in the rise of this movement? Yes. Absolutely. Do you mind elaborating on that? Yeah, I mean, everything from his policies that were identical to mine uh, 30 years ago to even some of the words, uh, uh, you know, and, and if we want to get even more granular to some of the tweets that he's directly put yes. out that promote other accounts it's called white genocide, which is a conspiracy theory about this great replacement, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that whites will be outbirthed and replaced. Uh, yeah, he, and he not only has promoted it, but he also has a responsibility as the leader of the free world, or maybe the former leader of the free world, because I'm not sure anybody thinks of America in that way mm. outside of, of our own country anymore. He has a responsibility to watch his words because his words, even though they're not directly uh, uh, telling somebody to do something, are encouraging people to commit these. They're signaling. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, I could say so much about about that piece of it, but there's a lot of um, leaders and, and people that are upholding the language. And I don't think this is a, a partisan argument at all. Not at all. Um, what based on the conversation we just had with the book and then um, the tweets and the languaging, what role does social media have at this moment in time? You know, social media is like that digital alleyway that I got recruited in, uh, except that now it's a 24-hour all-you-can-eat hate buffet if you're hungry. <laughs> it's very easy to find this information. It's not dark web. You know, some people think that, you know, it's it's hidden on the Internet. It, it is one or two clicks away for any 10-year-old to find, hmm. whether it starts out on Twitter or YouTube or Facebook. Uh you know, sending them down the rabbit hole is very, very easy. So a lot of this misinformation, you know, is coming from hostile foreign power. Some of it is coming from, you know, internally in our own country. Uh, but it just keeps spreading and spreading and spreading. And it's getting into chat rooms where kids hang out. It's getting into depression forums. They're starting to target people in autism communities because mm. mm. they're going after people they know don't have those connections with others in real life, mm. in the real world. And they're trying to win them over and establish their identity, community, and purpose in a virtual way. Do you see a role for schools in combating this? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I don't think that teach, I wouldn't put all the onus on teachers to fix this because I think it is all of our responsibility. Sure. But young people spend so much time with teachers. They spend more time with their teachers in some cases than they do with their parents. Mm. Uh, and that's also where they engage with other people and sometimes people that they normally wouldn't engage with in their personal lives. So I think it has to start mm. from our youngest, from the youngest age possible. Right. Uh, but we also need more teachers of color. There's a culture in this country where, you know, most teachers are white women and that even goes for teachers in communities of color are white women and there's no possible way especially you know in this time when we're all learning the nuance of this and understanding how to talk about it that a white person can fully you know explain or teach or even grasp the history that we have never taught in our classrooms uh, so we do need to recruit more women of color to teach before we wrap can you um share you have a, a new book coming out yeah. Um, can you talk about that? Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. my book uh, is coming out in February, uh, and it's called Breaking Hate, Confronting the New Culture of Extremism. And it's uh, essentially a seven mini memoirs of the people I've worked with, their stories of how they were radicalized and what I've done to help them come out. And it's a bit of a kind of a, a guidebook, uh, so to speak, on my process of how I work with people. And if we have any listeners are maybe getting in over their head, um, or they recognize that there are members of their family or community that are isolated and um, getting into this rabbit hole of hate and, and um, demonstrating behaviors that are concerning. What advice do you have for them? I would say don't be confrontational. Don't be, you know, aggressively pushing back. People don't respond well to that, especially people who feel, you know, that, they, that the world is already against them, uh, that are paranoid about the outside world. So it takes a lot of listening and listening for potholes and then a lot of pothole filling. Uh, but if they feel like they're way in over their heads, they can always uh, reach out to me for help. I work with people all around the country who can help intervene or provide advice for that. And they can just go to freeradicals.org. Thank you. And uh, Keith, our AG, do you have any closing comments for us? Any, any big dreams for Minnesota? Well, you know, I believe in that uh, whole thing about liberty and justice for all. Okay. I'm just, I just think it's a good idea. And uh, it's good to see you on this wonderful podcast. And you seem Thank like you. you're pretty good at this. I, I feel like I'm developing. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm developing. I appreciate all of, all of your time and good work. Um, I, I'm pretty clear that we have um, a road ahead of us. And I'm hoping that our listeners understand that we're not in a post-racial world that, um, you know, part of the conversation is, you know, paying attention to those folks that are isolated and um, that there is a degree of compassion um, and, and empathy and understanding that beneath the behavior um, is someone that's really crying out for, for help and, and identity and belonging. If I could say this real quick. Of course. So like, as you know, we, we, you and I were together recently talking about how we need to deal with cash bail. Yep. And how you, nobody should have to sit up in jail just because they can't pay the bill. Exactly That's right. ridiculous. This is pre-trial. It's crazy. We shouldn't do it. Uh, I believe in uh, you know lower, lowering, man, getting rid of mandatory minimum sentencing. I believe in saying we shouldn't, you know, uh, you can do what you want on marijuana, but making it a criminal offense yeah. 
is probably a bad idea. Certainly it has a disparate application in terms of racial justice. Uh, and so, and, and I also believe, you know, in the work of the Innocence Project, if we're gonna say we believe in the second chance and we believe that people who committed felonies should be able to vote, mm -hmm. how are we gonna not say to somebody who has been involved with the neo-Nazis or the Klan, hey, they, they apologize, they wanna come back, they're ready to do make make a life different. How are we gonna say no, not except you? I, I'm not I'm not there. I'm I'm like saying let's 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 be that prodigal son, you know, inviter back to our community. Not all of them are gonna be as articulate as Christian. Christian can break it down. He's he's mm -hmm. writing books, he's sharp, he knows his stuff. Some of them are gonna be just people who gonna just go back and, you know, just lead very ordinary lives. And I and, and I ran into a friend of mine the other day, who uh, happens to be a, an ex um, uh, anti racist person, okay. uh, and he said that he was working uh, in uh, Chicago, in a restaurant, and a lot of his friends who also worked there were were African Americans and Latinos, and one guy who was a fry cook gets it's hot midsummer in Chicago can be hot takes off the t shirt and there's you know swastikas and tats on them. And then these dudes, you know, they getting their testosterone macho up and they're going to know, figure out what they're going to do to him because, mm -hmm. you know. So he says, let me handle this. He walks in there and says, hey, man, what's with the tats, man? You know, we don't go for that. He says, that's not who I was. I'm not that guy anymore. In fact, I wish I could get rid of him. That was, I think, he, he just described that to me and it brought me back to when I handled the, the cases that I handled. And it just and I'm I'm like look you know second chances is second chances right, um, anyway that's all I want to say. Christian, do you still have your tats? Uh, I, they've all been covered up. Uh -huh. I have actually a suit of armor tattooed. Oh, over most of my body. There's one tattoo that I left, and it's on my forearm here, and it's not anything that I think anybody would notice as being related to uh, you know white nationalism or white supremacy. They're Viking runes that are tattooed around here, and. Um, I made a, a conscious effort not to cover them up because in 2000, I was walking through the mall. This was only a couple of years after I had gotten out myself. I hadn't talked about it. Uh, I was walking through the mall and a guy stopped me and he said, hey, bro, nice tattoos, white power. And that I pulled him to the side and I talked to him. And that was my first intervention. I didn't even know I was doing it at the time, but we talked for 20 minutes. And by the time we, you know, we separated and left, he wasn't ready to leave, but he was saying, that's pretty cool. I, you know, I, I respect you for doing that and walking away. And I hope that that individual found their way out. So I left it as kind of a way to establish credibility with the people I sit across the table from. It doesn't offend people because it's actually a co-opted co symbols that don't mean anything, you know, bad. Um, so I use it to, to really kind of, uh, you know, to make that connection. But I just want to go back and answer a question you asked earlier. You said, you know, what should we do? We don't recognize these people. And I think it's, it's our responsibility to really just be compassionate to everybody uh, and show empathy for everybody that we meet, especially if we don't know who they are and especially if we don't think that they deserve it because I think that they probably are the ones who would need it the most and might be able to benefit from it the most. Uh, that's not to say don't hold people accountable for their actions. Everybody is, and I've held myself accountable for 20 years. Uh, but I agree with Keith, and I think that if we provide that little bit of space to, for people who are genuine, who want to disengage, because I've never met a white supremacist who didn't want to leave. Mm -hmm. They may not have vocalized it. They may not have said it, but they wanted to because it is a dead end road. And once you're in, there's nowhere to go. Um, but there's also nowhere to escape if you want to. Mm -hmm. So when I think of you, I think of American History X. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Ed Norton movie. Right, the, yeah, right. Yeah, like yeah. I think of that. And um, I, I just think that we're not, um, because I think what that movie did was a pretty good job of showing what was happening at home and the struggles and, and the dimensions of this. And so I appreciate you today providing some dimension to this conversation. And uh, welcome to our great state. To order Christian Picciolini's new book, Breaking Hate, please visit BreakingHate.com. You can follow Shonda on Twitter at Shonda S. Baker. To listen to more episodes and learn about upcoming events, please visit ConversationsWithShonda.org. This is Sue Pak Thank you for listening to Conversations with Shonda.